Thanks for the opportunity to speak here. So uh, what I will talk about today is uh, a notion of, uh, Ricci, of a Ricci curvature for uh, discrete spaces that was developed by uh, Jan, Matthias, and Alexander Milke, and uh, a few applications to uh, functional inequalities and the study of uh, long-time behavior of stochastic processes. So, uh, in particular, I will talk about a few recent uh, results we obtained together with Matthias. So, um, what are we trying to do here? So, the starting point is that um, the uh, lower bounds on Ricci curvature have been successfully used to uh, study uh, analytical properties for uh, continuous stochastic processes on manifolds. For example, uh, functional inequalities, Harnack inequalities, heat kernel estimates, concentration bounds, many things. And um, what we would really like to have is, is a, an analogous practical tool to study the same properties, but for uh, stochastic processes on discrete spaces. So um, for pro I will mostly talk about uh, the situation from the point of view of probability. So uh, for a probabilist, uh, the, you can encode a lower bounds on curvature into properties of the, the Brownian motion on your manifold. For, you have several interesting properties. For example, if you look at on a manifold with strictly positive curvature, if you look at the, the law of the Brownian motion, it's going to converge to equilibrium, the volume measure, exponentially fast. This is just because its law is encoded by the, the heat flow, and we know that in positive curvature, the heat flow converges. Uh, and you can do even better. You can, If you look at Brownian motion starting from different configurations, you can find couplings, couplings in such a way that on average the Brownian motions will get closer and closer as time goes. And you, you have many fun useful functional inequalities. We'll later see spectral gaps, or logarithmic Sobolev inequalities. And what, what I'm interested in here is uh, to how to get uh, good quantitative estimates on the, the speed of conversion to equilibrium for systems in very high dimension. This, uh, this has many applications in, in statistical physics, statistics, for numerical sampling. Uh, so what we're going to explain is how uh, Matthias, uh, Jan, and uh, Alexander Milke uh, designed a, one a notion of uh, Ricci curvature for uh, discrete spaces and, and a few of its applications. So their starting point was the, the synthetic notion of Ricci curvature lower bounds of uh, Lutz, Filani, and Sturm. So as most of you probably already know here, uh, uh, on the manifold, uh, the curvature is bounded from below by some real number kappa. If and only if the, the relative entropy with respect to the, the volume measure has a nice convexity property along, along Wasserstein geodesic. So we're looking at geodesic curves in the, the space of probability measures with respect to the W2 distance. We look at how the entropy moves along geodesics, and if we have ha having positive, having curvature bounded from below is the same as having nice convexity properties for, for this entropy functional. But yeah, we, we've heard of this already in, in this workshop. And then they use this as a definition of a lower bounds on Ricci curvature. Well, at least for geodesic space. Now, the, the problem for discrete spaces is that um, uh, using the W2 distance is, uh, is actually turns out to be a terrible idea. Uh, for this definition, it's because uh, uh, W2 geodesics don't exist in discrete spaces. Uh, if the underlying, as soon as the underlying space is non-geodesic, uh, the space of probability measures won't be either. But um, these kinds of convexity, pro like, you, you won't be able to find that nice path such that uh, this kind of, these kinds of properties will be true several, uh, even if you, you wanted to kind of generalize notions of geodesic, it would still not work very well. It, it turns out that uh, the W2 distance is not very well adapted to discrete spaces. So uh, we have to do something different. So just to motivate the later definitions, uh, one of the reasons why this, uh, this, uh, the curvature is related to the behavior of the entropy and the Wasserstein distance is uh, the reinterpretation of uh, the heat flow on a manifold as a, as a gradient flow 
with respect to the entropy and in the space of probability measures by uh, Jordan Kinderler and Otto. So uh, by they, they, what they showed is that at least formally, you, if you, you, you can view the, evolution, the, the heat flow as a curve that tries to uh, has the, the steepest descent possible of the entropy, but with, uh, with the constraint of not going too far in, in W2 distance, uh, at least locally in time. And then, because of this reinterpretation, nice pro properties of the, the entropy can be reinterpreted into properties of the heat flow. And of course, the, the, the heat flow uh, contains many uh, information about the geometry of the underlying manifold. So for the, what we want to do is adapt the, this definition to the discrete setting. And what we need to do is decide what plays the role of the distance W2 and what measure to use to play the role of the volume. The entropy is well being changed. It, it still makes uh, sense in the discrete setting. But uh, if you come at it from the point of view of probability, it's uh, much more natural to decide what plays the role of Brownian motion and then try to build up everything else from, the, from what you have decided is Brownian motion. So the... From now on, we're, we're going to be on a finite, discrete spaces. And we assume we have fixed some continuous time Markov chain on that space. So we have a walker that jumps around on our space. And uh, assuming at some time the, the walker is on some point x, jumping from x to y will occur at some rate k of x, y, which is non-negative, which is also non-negative number. And all the time, we shall make the assumption that uh, there exists some reversible probability measure, phi. So a reversible probability measure is a measure such that if you assume the, the, you have a random walker whose law is distributed according to pi, then on average, the flow from a point x to y, so assuming you, uh, you have well, pi, is the same as the flow from pi to, uh, y to x. So at equilibrium, you, you don't see flows across bounds in your, uh, in your graph. So uh, this is also known as a detailed balance condition. And uh, this probability measure pi is what's going to play the, the role of the volume. So uh, what this assumption means is that if you look at the, the generator of your Markov chain, it's going to be symmetric in the L2 space associated to measure pi. Of course, this is exactly the analog of the, the, the symmetry of the, of the, the Laplacian in, the, the, uh, in, uh, in Riemannian geometry. So, so this, this, is a, a, this assumption is, of course, now not true for any Markov chain, but it, it play, it's still the analog of a property we have for, for the Laplacian in the, in the continuous setting. So it's, it's fairly natural to assume it. So uh, before going further, I, I, I want to expand a bit on what kind of examples of Markov chain we, we have in mind when, when looking at this. So a typical kind of example is like uniform random walks on grass. You, you have some graph, and when on a site dx, you, you look at how many neighbors they, 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 it has. And when you jump, you choose one of the neighbors uniformly at random, and you jump to it. Uh, another kind of example to have in mind is our uh, random walks on, on uh, finite groups. Now you, you fix a set of generators and you jump, you jump from x to gx with probability 1 over the number of generators. So you choose a, one of the generators uniformly at random and you jump. And um, Typically, you'll, you'll assume the set of generators to be symmetric so that you, you have nice, the, the reversibility property. And then the, the, the measure will be the uniform me measure on your sets. And this was down to, uh, to the, a random walk on the, the Cayley graph of the, of the group with this set. And of course, you, you can then start looking at uh, general Markov processes. And there's always a way of, of, of encoding these, uh, these Markov uh, general Markov chains as random walks and graphs up to having not uniform, 
not choosing uniformly at random the neighbors, but choosing in a weighted way with which neighbor you jump. Finally, I just wanted to say that um, if instead you, you have a, there is a particular measure you are in, uh, interested in, there are plenty of ways of building uh, an, a nice Markov chain that's uh, reversible with respect to this specific invariant measures. Like people in computer science have come up with plenty of algorithms to build these. Uh, the most famous is the, the Metropolis algorithm that's uh, used a lot in uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. So the question was, uh, is there a, a an analog to, to Ricci curvature lower bounds? for uh, Markov chains on discrete spaces. So the first mentions of this uh, question that I have found go back to the late 90s by, uh, by Gromov and Struck with, with the question of uh, what's the, 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 the Ricci curvature of the, of the discrete hypercube. So uh, they, they were conjecturing that the the value is uh, was of the n, n, n dimensional the value of Ricci curvature lower bound on the n dimensional uh, hypercube was two over n, and the problem there was not so much the, the value but uh, what does the sentence mean? Uh, and then throughout the years, uh, there have been like half a dozen possibilities that have been uh, put forward, going back to to the the Bakri-Emery notion of curvature that that makes perfect sense in a in a discrete spaces, but uh, and then. More recent uh, definitions have been put forward by uh, Olivier, Monsieur Kahnsturm, and then the Herbarmas and Milka notion I will talk about. And more recently by uh, Gozolan, Roberto, Roberto Sanson, and Tetali, as well as by Leonard. Um, okay, but I will talk about the one by Mas, yeah, Herbar and Milka. So, uh, what they uh, pointed out is that if you take uh, your Markov chain, on a discrete space, and they assume it to be reversible. Then uh, you can build a distance on the space of probability measures, so that the evolution of the law of the Markov chain is the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to this distance. So the entropy is still the the same entropy as in the in the continuous setting. So uh, the entropy with respect to pi of some probability density rho is just uh, sum over x's of rho of x log rho of x pi of x. So exactly the same thing as in the, the continuous setting. So uh, essentially what they did is they did they, uh, they, they mimicked the, the benamou brenier formula to try to build a, a distance so that when you then take the, the gradient of the entropy with respect to that distance, you, you end up exactly with the, uh, with the evolution of the law of the Markov chain, which is, which is known. So um, the benamou brenier formula, I'll uh, just to remind you, write it down, is that the book two of mu Zero mu one infimum zero to one u t and you minimize over all you take a path mu t that goes from mu zero to mu one you find a vector field such that the the, continu the following continue equation holds. Then you look at the the, act, uh, the the action of this vector field along the curve, and you minimize it over all possible choices. So, and when you do this, you end up with the square of the, the Wasserstein distance. So, the, if you want to, to mimic this, what do you have to do? First, you you have to decide what's the analog of a, of a vector field on your uh, on a, in the discrete world. So, in the discrete world, uh, what uh, vector fields give you direction in which you move. On a graph, the direction in which you move would be the edges of your graph. So for what will play the role of a, of a vector field is a function of edges or a function of pairs of points. And now, in the continuous setting, when you averaged out the action, you averaged out against the measure mu t. But here in the discrete setting, mu, the, uh, the measure will live on vertices, not on edges. So you need a way to associate 
uh, a measure on edges to a measure on uh, on, ver on vertices. So for now on, let's stick with some uh, some general measure row hats that lives on edges. And later on, it turns out that there will be a, a right choice of, of row hat. So you take a function of edges such that this condition is satisfied. This is the analog of the, the continuity equation for the uh, uh, in the continuous setting. So this is a the, this is a discrete divergence with respect to this measure on edges, and we distort this divergence with the, the rates of the Markov chain because, of course, if rates are higher, you go it's easier to go in certain directions. And then once you have a curve that satisfies the continuity equation, you take the action, the squared action along this curve, and then you minimize over all possible choices of curves, and you do end up with a distance. And now uh, it turns out that if you want your uh, uh, the, the evolution of the law of the Markov chain to be the gradient flow of the entropy with respect to this distance, there is exactly one choice of measure on edges that works, and it's to take the, the logarithmic mean of the, uh, the, the, the weight on the two neighboring vertices. So this, is, this turns out to be exactly what you have to take, and why is that? It's because in the discrete setting, we have no chain rule. But if you, if you look at uh, in the continuous setting, what you also often want to do is to say that the gradient rho, gradient of log rho, is gradient of rho. If you take a discrete gradient, this is not true at all. But by choosing this weight, you have the relation rho hat, gradient of log rho, is gradient of rho. So th this is a, a way to artificially enforce the, the chain rule for logarithm in the, in the discrete setting. And because our entropy involves a logarithm, this turns out to be exactly the, the right choice to make to, to get things to work. OK. Um, now, uh, nice thing about this, uh, uh, this is, is if you think of the, the space of probability measures on a, on a finite space, it's a simplex. It's a, it's a subset of R n, where n is the number of uh, is the number of points with the constraint that they must they are all non-negative and must sum to one. So it's as long as you stay uh, away from the, the it's the simplex and uh, at least as long as you stay away from the edges it's a very nice smooth uh, manifold and this turns out to be uh, a Riemannian metric on the on the simplex. Uh, the downside of, of this distance is that it's uh, it's uh, completely non-local, unlike the if you uh, Unlike in the uh, in the, the classical setting where you, you will move around, you will, your transports will move things around locally, because you're discrete, you have to be able to jump from one point to another, and in some sense the, the minimization will zoom out a bit to see where it has to go. Uh, this will cause some issues. I will I will mention later on in the talk. Uh, okay, so once we we have this distance for which the, the evolution of the law of the Markov chain is the gradient flow of the entropy. We can take the exact same definition as the continuous setting and say that the, the curvature of the, uh, the Markov chain is bounded from below by kappa. If for any geodesic with respect to this curly W distance, the entropy along the geodesic is convex as you go, uh, as you go along. And now uh, this Distance is indeed geodesic in the space of probability measures, so this this makes perfect sense. Now and, and then, as in the continuous setting, the the practical criterion to figure out if curvature is bounded from below or not is we can figure out equations for the geodesics. We compute the second derivative of the entropy along these geodesics. We have a certain quantity that pops up. I, I won't write it down, but uh, the practical criterion is to check if this quantity is bounded from below. Uh, by some by some constants to to decide whether uh, curvature is bounded from below. And in the continuous setting, when you do this, because of the Buckner formula, when you compute the second uh, derivative, you can you end up with the uh, with the Ricci curvature tensor. In the discrete setting, you you don't have this. And and indeed, um, because the the metric is non-local, uh, 
the quantity you end up with uh, won't be local either. So uh, here the, the action is not linear in the in the, the measure uh, in the choice of, in the, the measure row, the probability density row. So you end up with a with a quantity that's that's not uh, linear in the second derivative of the entropy is not linear in the the measure, and you you get more complicated expressions that to check than in the continuous setting. Okay, so this uh, notion of curvature enjoys uh, several nice properties. So uh, the important property is uh, the tensorization property. Uh, if you start looking at independent copies of Markov chains on product spaces, then you you preserve curvature lower bounds. Like you you keep the the, the lower bound on the curvature for the, the worst of these uh, Markov chains. In particular, if you take an n-fold product and independent copies of the same Markov chain. You, you preserve curvature bounds up to rescaling time if you want. So uh, this means that uh, there is hope for this curvature to notion to behave well in high dimension. Uh, later I will talk about consequences in terms of functional inequalities. So we, we, have, we end up with several nice functional inequalities. And there's also a discrete version of the otto villani theorem that's related to functional inequalities that I will also mention later. But uh, at, to this day, the, the main downside of this notion of curvature is that uh, it's hard to establish bounds in, in concrete situations. So I'm going to present a few examples for which we, we can establish them. But uh, hopefully, uh, this is not all we can do. But OK, so the first and kind of canonical example is the one already raised by Goma van Stroke is you look at the simple random, simple random walk on an n-dimensional hypercube. So you have n coordinates which are zero, either 0 or 1. And with rate 1, you choose one coordinate uniformly at random, and you flip it. If it was 0, it's now 1, and, and the reverse. And then it turns out that uh, this Markov chain has indeed curvature bounded from below by 2 over n, where n is the dimension. So the 1 over n factor is because uh, by saying I, we move at rate 1, it's not independent copies, it's like we have rescaled time by a factor n to, to move at rate 1. So this is why we have the 1 over n factor. So um, nice thing about this is that when you let n go to infinity, because of the cent uh, central limit theorem, when you sum over the coordinates up to subtract the average and divide it by the variance, you, you converge to a Gaussian. And indeed, after rescaling uh, the curvature, We'll go to the to one, which is indeed the curvature of the Gaussian space. So this this notion of curvature, at least for this example, goes well to the limit, and we recover the, the sharp bound for the limit. So this is this has to be the the best possible bound. So and the proof of this uh, result by Albert and Mass is uh, so for n equals one, this is just a two point space. You can do direct computations. And then you have the tensorization property to, to recover the, the result for any. Second example is the simple random walk on a, on a discrete torus. So you're just on z over nz. And with rate 1, you jump right or left with probability 1 half. And this is like you're discretizing the torus. So indeed, this has, just like the, the torus has non-negative curvature, this Markov chain has also has non-navigative curvature, so this is still coherent. And indeed, these uh, these torses are what plays the role of flat spaces. They're like the, the reference space with with constant zero curvature. And more generally, you can show that if you take any symmetric random walk on an abelian gr group, then uh, curvature is always non-negative. So, so in particular for toruses, products of toruses, and so on. Finally, the last example I want to talk for now, which is a bit more sophisticated one, is the following. So you have particles moving around on the complete graph. So all vertices are connected to each other. But uh, they're not just performing random walks. They are interacting with each other. So you have L sites on your complete graph. You have k particles. And given that the, on a site x, there is a certain number n of particles, the jump rate from the site x is going to depend on the site x and on the number of particles currently present n. So uh, if 
if you had the linear rate Cx of n was just n, this would correspond to uh, independent walks. Like the, they, they don't interfere with each other. But as soon as you take a nonlinear rate, there is some interaction between your particles. And uh, the result uh, obtained with Yan uh, Mass uh, last year is that uh, if your rates are uniformly increasing, so the, the, the increase is bounded from below by some constant c, but also from above by some constant c plus delta. And delta is not too large compared to C. So the rates are strictly increasing, but they're not increasing too fast either. Then you can show that uh, curvature is bounded from below by some constants that depends on C and delta, but not on the number of particles or the size of your graph. And uh, this is sharp because there are some results about the behavior of these dynamics in, uh, when you let the size of the graph and the number of particles go to infinity that say that various estimates are stable, particular to functional inequalities, we'll later see. So that it, this is kind of expected that you get something, uh, this is what you want. You want to get something that doesn't depend on the, on the parameters of your Markov chain, only on the, the, the rate of increase. Now, um, if the rates are homogeneous, so they, they truly depend on x, then we do not expect to be able to remove uh, the assumption of an upper bound on the rates. The, the particular assumption on delta might not be optimal, but it, it, uh, uh, we cannot get a uniform curvature bound if we assume something uh, of this form, uh, uh, with some, but with delta too high, like beyond a certain threshold. Uh, for the homogeneous case where all the rates are the same, uh, it might be that, well, we would hope that uh, a lower bound assumption would be enough, but uh, we don't know how to prove this. Uh, the method of proof is, uh, is, was based on, on an attempt at mimicking the, the Buckner identity in the discrete setting, so uh, we don't have something as nice as the Buckner identity. But it turns out that for nice systems having some good spatial invariance properties, like kind of like if you take two different jumps and you do, do and in what order you do them doesn't interfere too much, it turns out that we can prove a nice inequality by trying to mimic the proof of Buckner inequality identity to show that for systems with nice spatial invariance properties, curvature is not always non negative. This is, for example, the case for abelian Cayley graphs. And then to get positive curvature for systems that have some interference, what we do is we kind of divide our, our chain in two sub-Markov chains, one with uh, good spatial invariance properties that has a non-negative contribution to the curvature, and a reminder that we treat by hand as, like we try to get hard estimates, but uh, we can reduce this to a much simpler Markov chain. Uh, to uh, treat by hand. Okay. So that, those are all the examples I wanted to talk about right now. So um, now applications. So I, I mentioned this earlier, but we, we have several nice consequences in terms of functional inequalities. So uh, assuming that the curvature is bounded from below by some strictly positive kappa, we have an upper bound on the variance of some function f by Dirichlet form. So this, this Dirichlet form E is what plays the role of uh, the integral of inner product of gradients. So this is uh, the discrete version of the of Poincaré inequalities, and it also is as in the continuous setting. It tells you that uh, the generator of your Markov chain has a spectral gap, so a bound between the first and second eigenvalues. Then we have an upper bound on the entropy by a Dirichlet form of f and log f. So this is the discrete analog of the log uh, logarithmic Sobolev inequality. We know this as the modified logarithmic Sobolev inequality because in the discrete setting, since we have no chain rule, you, you, there are several things that are formally analogous to the logarithmic Sobolev inequality, depending on what you put in the uh, Form. Instead of f and log f, you could put square root of f and square root of f, 
in the continuous setting because of the chain rule, this would make no difference. In uh, the discrete setting, these various inequalities are not equivalent at all. For example, uh, for a random walk on a complete graph, because curvature is non negative, we get this uh, inequality with a constant that does not depend on the size of your complete graph. But the, what, there, if you used in the Dirichlet form square root of f, this would not be true. So the, the choice of the Dirichlet form is in the discrete setting is actually quite crucial. And then we, we have an analog of the of Telecon's inequality that says you can bound the distance, curly w instead of w2, by the entropy. And uh, discrete HWI inequality that bounds the entropy by an interpolation between the distance and, uh, the, and uh, this, which is the, the Fisher information. And these various inequalities have plenty of applications. They, they tell you some, they give you some bounds on how fast your dynamic converges to equilibrium. There are some applications to, to, high dimen to uh, the study of interacting particles in statistical physics. Uh, as in the continuous setting, they imply a con Gaussian concentration bounds for the, the measure of pi and so on. Uh, okay, so for the convergence of equilibrium, this is the same as the continuous setting. Uh, the modified Lagrisobolev inequality holds if and only if you have exponentially fast convergence to equilibrium in relative entropy. This is because this, uh, this directly form, if you differentiate the entropy along your, uh, the, your Markov chain, this is the, the entropy production functional. And similarly, spectral gap, as usual, conver controls convergence to equilibrium in L2. And uh, MLSI is strictly stronger than, uh, than the spectral gap. So if you, if, you, if you can get an MLSI, uh, you're, you're happier because you get better bounds on convergence to equilibrium, but it's harder to establish in practice. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a, uh, because using this, uh, the, these uh, notions of gradient flows, uh, Elbert and Mass showed that uh, the MLSI always implies a telecon inequality independently of whether a curvature is, uh, is bounded from below or not. Okay, so once you notice, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, what's going on in, uh, if you don't assume curvature to be bounded below by a strictly positive constant, but just by a non-negative constant. Uh, you just assume it's non-negative. So in the Riemannian setting, you, you have classical results of uh, Li Yao and uh, Zhang Yang that tell you that on a compact manifold with non-negative curvature, and some bound on the diameter. The spectral gap is bounded from below by pi square over d square. So the, the first result by Liao was this, but with an extra factor two. And then uh, Zhang Yang uh, removed the uh, factor two, and now this constant pi square is actually optimal. So uh, for the non-negative curvature setting, of course, you expect just non-negative curvature not to be enough to ensure a spectral gap. If you just look at uh, Rn and the Brown in motion, there is no spectral gap. So you'd need some extra assumption anyway. And what they showed is that uh, bounded diameter is enough to, to ensure a control, a universal control on the spectral gap. And so uh, recently with uh, Matthias, what we showed is that the same holds for uh, Markov chains with non-negative curvature. Instead of phi square, we have some universal constant C. We don't, we are pretty sure we didn't get the optimal constant. Uh, and the diameter is the diameter for the this curly W distance, so the, so the maximal distance between two Dirac masses. And uh, the same is true for the modified logarithmic Sobolev inequality. If you have non-negative curvature, then it's bounded from below by some constant over D square with some other universal constant C. And once more, uh, we don't we don't know what the the, the the best universal constant would be. Uh, of course, uh, you want, uh, the, the, the behavior of this uh, estimate is sharp because if you, if you in the classical setting, uh, this is actually the spectral gap for a one-dimensional torus with dim di diameter d. So it's actually reached and there's even a rigidity theorem stating that uh, 
if you have diameter d and this is exactly the spectral gap, then your space is actually isometric to the, the one dimensional torus. And in the same way, in the discrete setting, this uh, one over d square up to the constant is the, the sharp behavior of the, the spectral gap for uh, random walks on one dimensional discrete toruses. So, so this is the, indeed uh, the best possible uh, universal low bound up to the, the value of the, the constant. So uh, it's possible to, to slightly weaken the, the assumption by, uh, instead of assuming the diameter to be bounded, we assume that there's a finite square exponential moment. So you, you take the distance curly w, you average the, the squared distance to some fixed point, the exponential of the squared distance with respect to some fixed point, and you average with respect to the invariant measure of pi. If this quantity is finite, it's enough to ensure a, a lower bound on the spectral gap and on the log sub -left constants. That only depend on this exponential moment. And uh, you can also generalize this to allow some slightly negative curvature, so curvature bounded from below by minus kappa. But then you, you need uh, the diameter to be smaller than some constant that would depend on, on this lower bound. So uh, I don't know if this would have any practical applications. OK, uh, just a quick sketch of the proof for what's going on for the spectral gap. So the first step of the proof is a kind of lo is our local gradient estimates, kind of like a Harnack inequality in continuous setting, that show some instantaneous regularization. If you look at a bounded function, and PT here is the, the heat flow, then you, after some time t, bounded functions become Lipschitz. And the Lipschitz constant only depends on the, the bound on your function and on the time. This is with respect to the curly w distance. So uh, once you have this, then you can show that because of the curvature of the non-negative curvature, the Dirac form is uh, decreasing along the flow. Which is also, and since it's also the derivative of the variance along the flow, you can show that the variance is bounded by 2t times the Dirac form plus the variance of pt of f. So this here is what you want. And you have this extra variance term you want to control. And because you know that pt of f became Lipschitz, you can control this by the Lipschitz constant, the diameter. So you have here, you have an L infinity bound. But with a prefactor t that you can make as small as you want. And the next step is from the HWI inequality. You can control the entropy by the Dirac form and some L2 moment up to the, along the diameter. And from this, it turns out that you, it's non-trivial, but it's some algebraic manipulations. You end up with a control of the variance by this slightly modified Dirac form and some a square of an L1 norm. So what you end up is, you say, OK, right now we don't have a bound by, of the variance by the Dirac form. But we know that the, there's an error that's made that's controlled both by the L infinity norm and the L1 norm. And the variance is of type L2. So then you can split your function into a function keeping only the values below, above a certain threshold another function that just keeps the value below a certain threshold. When it's large, you control it by the L1 norm. When it's small, you control it by the L infinity norm. You fiddle around a bit, and in the end, you can combine the, the two non-tight inequalities into a, a tight inequality where the, the reminder terms have disappeared. So the, the general philosophy here is that uh, when you, you have fun non-tight functional inequalities, but of two di with two different estimates on the, the reminders that are of really different uh, natures, you can try to, 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 to get rid of both of them at the same time by, by combining them. OK. Now, um, the unfortunate thing about this uh, estimate of the spectral gap by the diameter is that uh, it behaves badly in high dimension. If you look at uh, products of spaces, the diameter, the square diameter grows linearly in the dimension, but the, the spectral gaps tensorized, they, they should be stable. And same thing for log Sobolev inequality, same thing for curvature bounds. So it's, uh, these kind of estimates behave badly in, in high dimension. So in particular, if you, if you apply them to, to 
physics systems from statistical physics where you expect some nice stable behavior in, in high dimension, you will never get the, the, the right thing. Uh, for example, so this was one of the motivations. If you take a zero range process with this process, but instead of taking increasing rates, you assume that the rates are just some constant. So the particles start blocking each other. If you have more particles on the site, it doesn't. They, they, they it won't make it actually slows them down. Um, this uh, this dynamic has non-negative curvature. So we can apply our result, and we get a modified lux Sobolev inequality with some constants as in c over k square log l. K was the number of particles. L the size of graph. The log L factor might be spurious. It might be that our diameter estimate is not exactly sharp, but the, 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 the k squared really is there. So this is the this is the, the well, it's the best known bound now for for the, the, the log sub left constant of this dynamic. But conjecturally, it should be off by a factor k. We we expect that at fixed density, k over L, that stays away from zero. The sharp constant should behave like when L over K square, so one over K. Um, so we, by you, because diameter estimates, like in product situations, they're, they're off by a dimensional factor. We end up also with that, uh, estimates that are off by a dimensional factor for, for these systems. And uh, just to finish, I, I want to mention a conjecture for this that uh, uh, so in the continuous setting, Emmanuel Millman showed that instead of using the diameter, you can use an assumption of a bound on some kind of effective Gaussian diameter. You, you assume that the, there's some Gaussian concentration with some constant rho, fixed constant rho, and then you show that in non-negative curvature, you can control the Poincaré constant and the log Sobolev constant just by this constant rho. And typically, um, unlike the diameter, you can hope that these kind of Gaussian uh, concentration bounds tensorize and hope for uh, stable estimates in high dimension. So if we could establish this conjecture in the discrete setting, we could hope to gain a dimensional factor on our estimates. And in particular, hopefully, get, uh, improve the estimate for the zero range process and get a, a, better, a better constant. Um, this conjecture is not so much about whether the, this condition is enough to ensure a bounds on the spectral gap and log Sobolev constant. This is true. We can prove it. It's, just, it's that we, we don't know how to show that it only depends on the constant row here. We, we, uh, we end up with, we can show that the, the, this, con this condition is enough to ensure a bound, but uh, the bounds depend on some square exponential moment, which can be that, which is dimensional. So we, we don't uh, get to a dimension-free estimate. Okay, so I think I'm out of time, so I won't mention the other examples. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, zero range process. Zero range process. So it, it's the name of this uh, dynamic particle system where uh, when you jump, you only jump to neighbors, so the, the range of the jumps is, is, is zero. Yeah. It has positive curvature for two, three, and four. And once you go beyond, five, well, we don't have a hard proof that it's not, it's not better, in, but we don't expect it to be better as soon as n is bigger than 5. So 2 is so it's the two-point space. 3 is the complete graph, which has positive curvature, and 4 is just the product of two-point two, two space. But once you go beyond that, uh, we, we don't expect it. Uh, if you look at other notions of curvature, which are more combinatorial in nature, they can show for these that uh, curvature stops being strictly positive exactly at n equals 5. So, sorry. Sorry, I didn't understand.
Uh, you, you have estimates. I, I cannot give them to you from memory, but they're in uh, the paper by uh, Matthias and Jan. Uh, 